Thank you for checking out this talk from the Fierce Families Conference that took place back in October of 2023. Our mission for this conference was to put God's design for marriage and family on full display, and then to equip marriages and families to live out God's beautiful design in the context in which he's placed them. So if you'd like to learn more about the Fierce Families Conference, perhaps to attend a conference in the future, or to bring the Fierce Families Conference to your own area, just go to fiercefamilies.com. Some 60 plus times, I have stood before two wild-eyed souls and asked them the following. Groom, will you have this woman to be your wife? And will you pledge your faithfulness to her in all love and honor, in all duty and service, in all faith and tenderness, to live with her and cherish her according to the ordinance of God and the holy bond of marriage? Will you? And then I look at the bride. Will you have this man to be your husband, and will you pledge your faithfulness to him in all love and honor and all duty and service and all faith and tenderness to live with him and cherish him according to the ordinance of God in the holy bond of marriage? Will you? They have always answered yes. I am yet to receive a no, but sometimes I think to myself, you have no idea. Then a few minutes later, having worked our way to the vows, I again look into the two wild-eyed souls, and I ask them to repeat after me. I, groom, take you bride to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge myself truly with all my heart. I pledge my faith to keep this vow. Then I turn to her, I bride take you groom as my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness, health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge myself truly with all my heart. I pledge my faith to keep this vow. And I mutter to myself one more time, you have no idea. We are familiar with Ephesians 5 and what it says regarding the primary responsibilities of the husband and wife. Toward the end of that text, Paul quotes from Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. And then the apostle adds, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, many couples, Christian and non-Christian believe marriage is simply moving in with someone they think will be fun to live with. Some Christian couples get the Ephesians 5 thing, and they know that marriage is bigger than saying I do and sharing a bed. They realize that each has a role to play. We know this. The husband plays the role of Jesus, Loving his wife as Jesus loves the church. The wife plays the role of the church, submitting and respecting her husband as the church is to submit and respect Jesus. And, that the, and that when those roles are played well, when they are played well, we speak truth about Jesus' relationship with the church. But when we don't play those roles well, we tell lies. A case can be made that we are even blaspheming God. Communicating untruths about him when our marriage fails to live up to Ephesians 5. And that's troubling. Now, this talk this evening is entitled A Greater Vision. And I called it such because I want to go a step further than that, than what I have just said. A step deeper than we just presented what our marriages really are communicating to the world about Jesus. What are they? 1923, J. Gresham Machen published his response to the growing liberalism of the day that had already invaded the church. In his seminal book, Christianity and Liberalism, Machen exposed the fallacies, the lies of liberalism, and then contrasted it to the orthodox truths of Christianity. In his introduction, he wrote, 
In the sphere of religion, in particular, the present time is a time of conflict. The great redemptive religion, which has always been known as Christianity, is battling against a totally diverse type of religious belief, which is only the more destructive of the Christian faith because it makes use of traditional Christian terminology. And then, four chapters later, he says the most pulled quote from his book. It is no wonder, then, that liberalism is totally different from Christianity. For the foundation is different. Christianity is founded upon the Bible. It bases upon the Bible both its thinking and its life. Liberalism, on the other hand, is founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men. And there is, therein is my thesis for the next 25 plus minutes. Let me explain. Too many Christian marriages are not founded upon the Bible. Rather, they are founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men and women. Do you have an orthodox marriage? One based upon the Bible, or do you have a liberal one? One based upon the whims and emotions of sinful man. And I want to give you four tests, four evaluative tools that you might answer such a question. I want us to envision our marriage as a parish. Now, that isn't a word we Protestants use much, but it's a good word. If the church is a building, a parish is the community within the church. The ladies' Bible study, for instance, is a, is a parish within the church. The men's breakfast is, the, the youth group, etc., and on and on. Small groups within the church. So think of it as a fellowship group or a gathering within the church. That's a parish. Now, with that definition, the smallest expression of a parish within our churches is what? Is our marriage. Now, let's ask the question. Is your parish, your marriage, orthodox or is it liberal? Is your parish based upon God's word or man's word? Is your parish communicating truth about Jesus and his church? Or is it communicating lies? How is one to know? In his recent book, Gashmu, Gashmu Saith, the most poorly titled book that Doug Wilson has ever written, Subtitled, How to Build Christian Communities That Save the World, he wrote this regarding Ephesians 5. Husbands, your task is to model for the world what the objective gospel actually looks like. And in case you've forgotten, it looks like blood, sweat, and tears. You are the hands of Christ as he preaches his message of salvation to the world. And never forget that those hands are pierced. You are husbands. You are to be pierced. You are the head. Does that tempt you to puff yourself up? Though that meant, though that meant you are the, the, the king boss? No, you are the head and you are instructed to be the head the same way Jesus was. How is Jesus the head? Well, remember that if you're the head... You are supposed to have a crown of thorns jammed on it. And wives, your task is to model for this lost world what a subjective and personal response to the gospel looks like. Give me a moment. He continues. Husbands, the world is watching you. You are to model what the saving looks like. Wives, the world is watching you. You are to model what salvation looks like. So husband, let's start with you very quickly. Are you modeling what Jesus' saving looks like? Wilson's description contained the words blood, sweat, tears, crown of thorns. But we all would have to admit, do we not, that those words often do not describe many guys. Sadly, there are more examples of an irresponsible man who doesn't take ownership of his home. A despondent man collapsing onto his couch each night, TV remote in his hand. Or a stoic man emotionally detached from his wife and kids. Wives, are you modeling what being saved looks like? 
That would be a submissive and respectful yielding. Sadly, there are more examples, are there not, of a discontent woman who compares her life to what she sees on social media. A frustrated woman who is joyful maybe two days a week. Or a bitter woman who thinks she deserves better. Not a God-honoring parish here from the husband and from the wife. So evaluative tool number one of your parish to determine whether it is orthodox or liberal. Husbands, how well are you modeling the gospel? What Jesus saving us looked like. Blood, sweat, tears, thorns. That's Jesus loving his bride. Wives, how well are you modeling what the gospel does? What being saved looks like, exhibiting the submission and respect the church has for her groom. Now, your answers, your answers to those two questions dictate whether your marriage is proclaiming orthodox, real Christianity or whether you are proclaiming apostate, false Christianity. Here's the second evaluative tool. A biblical marriage, parish, breaks you. It does. It breaks you. And one of the reasons God designed marriage as he did is to radically transform a man and a woman. It is one of his greatest sanctifying tools. Upon entering marriage, most couples exit the most selfish time of their lives. A single person does what a single person wants to do. For the most part, spending their resources, time, talent, treasure, the way they want. And for many, that means living life doing you. You ate what you wanted and when you wanted. You went to bed when you wanted. You watched the Netflix show you wanted to watch. If you wanted to go out, you went out. If you wanted to stay home, you stay home, etc. You did you because, well, it was just you. But then you got married. Marriage is the beginning of a lifelong process of handing over absolutely everything to another. You don't just hand over what you own, you hand over everything that you are. And if a husband and wife do this well, as God instructs, they will be broken by the process. Much like a lump of clay on the potter's wheel, in that breaking, the husband and wife become more the man and woman of God he desires. Whatever the length and quality of the dating or courtship was like, that was all practice. You said you love the other. Well, marriage demands that you prove it. In his book, The Mystery of Marriage, author Mike Mason talks about marriage being a state of constant surveillance. Yeah, I, I'd giggle too, because man, isn't that true? It is. And that is one of the hardest parts of being married, of being watched all the time. The bright light of marriage scrutiny is upon you, writes Mason. The little defenses and facades and masquerades we all play from time to time outside, out there, out in the rest of our life, is difficult to be played inside marriage. Because our island, our castle, our fortress, whatever we want to call what we had before, is now inhabited by another person. Marriage demands transparency. There's nowhere to hide. You are exposed. The hidden you percolates to the top. And most of the time what surfaces is sin. The kind of sin that up to this point the single you had been able to tap down. Been able to hide. No more. But this is not bad. This is not bad. In fact, it is the opposite. This is very good, but it can be very hard. Marriage is a relationship far more involved than realized. At times, it can be more than we bargain for. It can be disturbingly intense. It is because it is supposed to be more than we can handle. Remember, it is God's great sanctifying tool... Marriage is God whittling away, chopping away, at our selfishness and self-centeredness. If a man, 
It, it is a man learning to love a wife as Jesus loves the church, for crying out loud. That's a tough lesson. It's a woman learning to respect and submit to a husband as the church respects and submits to Jesus. That's a hard lesson to learn. It is why marriage, even the very best ones, are a crisis. The quotable Chesterton, he already, this is his second time he's been mentioned already. He quipped somewhere, marriage is an adventure akin to going to war. Whether it turns out well depends largely on how willing each is willing to change, how willing each party is willing to mature, how willing each is taking a step closer to Jesus. So evaluative tool, number, uh, evaluative tool number two of your parish, husbands and wives, is your marriage breaking you? Are you being changed, transformed, becoming more like Jesus? A Bible-believing church is a place of dynamic change. It is. It's because the word of God is consistently before the congregation. As such, congregants are regularly exposed and confronted. God's word is efficacious. That means it does stuff. It changes people. Likewise, a marriage reflecting Orthodox Christianity has within it a husband and wife who are being transformed through the good, the bad, and the ugly. The furnace of marriage refines them both. Now, counter, of course, is the liberal version. Within it is a husband and wife who refuse to change. This is who I am. And this is who I'll always be. They bow their back. They're rigid as steel. They are not transformed. They remain the same, often mirroring the selfish and self-centered ways of their singleness. They are roommates. They are not husband and wife. Here's the third tool. We just spoke how marriage is to break us. Break us by confronting our sin and sending us further down the road of our sanctification. But marriage, now in this third tool, breaks us in another way. Marriage calls us to give up vice. Yes, we know this. But sometimes it calls us to refrain from virtue. I'll say it again, and then, then, and then an explanation. Marriage calls us to give up vice, yes, but sometimes it calls us to refrain from virtue. The reformers said a true church did three things. Proclaim God's word, properly administered the sacraments, and practice church discipline. If you find those three things, you found a church. But a church that doesn't do those three things, uh-uh, falls short. An Orthodox, an Orthodox church does this, must do this. These are the three essential marks. Now, there are other good things for a church to do, of course. Care for the widow, concern for the orphan, feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, on and on. A Bible-believing church is interested in doing those things. The liberal church, however, the unorthodox church, flips this. They embrace the social gospel at the expense of, ex of exhibiting the three essential marks. Go with me here. As such, they cease being a church. They become a service organization. Now, next to our love for God, there's nothing more important than our love for our spouse. Agreed? Nothing on earth can take precedence over our marriage. Our parish must be protected. What this means is that it is not just the selfish and bad of who we are that must be sanctified and mortified. There are times when good and healthy things must be renounced, postponed, and lessened on account of our marriage too. This is hard. This is really hard for me. I can tell you story after story. Mike Mason writes, how many deep friendships that might have been are rendered impractical by marriage? Or must at least take a back seat to the primary friendship with one's spouse? How many wonderful activities are interrupted by marriage duties? And how many good intentions and charitable plans must be set aside each day? How much energy that might otherwise have been put at the service of the church or the community is channeled instead into the work of marriage? 
Like Judas Iscariot at the sight of Mary pouring out costly perfume over the feet of Jesus, we cry out, this ointment might have been sold and the money given to the poor. He then says this, what offends us is the terrible waste of marriage. The waste of our precious lives being poured out on over just one other person? He then explains, this is what a radical business these little vows of marriage involve us in. They pit the needs and wants of one small, frail, love-starved human creature against the demands of all the rest of the universe. With all its urgency and glory and importance. And there's no contest. It's our spouse who must win. Most marriages learn this the hard way. When two become one, there's less room. Some good things are crowded out. All other relationships change. Other loves minimized. This is not to say a biblical marriage is inward looking. It is not an eternal gaze into the eyes of another while the rest of the world burns. It is not a mutual admiration society of two who expend all their time and energy on one another. Our marriage is not to be an idol. But our marriage must be jealously guarded. There are to be walls. So evaluative tool number three, husband and wives, have you built protective walls around your parish? Answer this question rhetorically. Can you point to relationships, activities, passions of yours that have been renounced, postponed, and lessened on account of your marriage? Have there been any? An orthodox and Bible-believing church has its priorities, those given them by God. They are not to be distracted from the main thing. An unorthodox church, driven by the whims of the day, majors in the minors. By doing so, ceases to be a church. Has your parish rightly prioritized the husband-wife relationship? Or has it been crowded out by other virtuous things, good things? Sometimes it is those virtuous things that do more damage than vice. One more tool. How are your parishioners doing? Oh, you have parishioners. Your kids. What has become clear to me over the years, almost 30 years now, is that the husband and wife relationship spills over to the kids. It does. Children are children. They're childish. But if there is a sustained period where a child is emotionally distraught or acting up or being unusually needy, I wonder if there's something going on in their parents' marriage. It is remarkable how children, even young children, know when things are not well between mom and dad. When the stability they crave is shaken, they don't know what to do with that. And this not only concerns their emotional health, but their spiritual health. As well, your marriage greatly impacts your child's current and future faith. Do I have your attention? The liberal church, which is no church at all, is losing their kids. If you visit a mainline denomination that denied the faith decades ago, there are no children in their pews. Just the elderly. The only reason the elderly is still there is because they donated money for the new pews years ago, so they can't walk away from that. Or how can they leave their friends they've had for years in their card club, in their quilting group? But the kids, no, they got out of there. As soon as they turned 18 or whatever, as soon as they could, because why stay at a place where on Sunday morning the lesbian pastor leads the congregation in the Sparkle Creed? And if you don't know what that is, Google it later. What creed are you living in your home? What are your children seeing, hearing, experiencing in your home? Hypocrisy has a wretched smell, and it is easily detected. 
Mom and dad never talking, never touching, never joyful about the marriage. But come Sunday morning, they have the painted smile on them that is as fake and detestable as that painted smile on Batman's nemesis, the Joker. Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Implores the psalmist. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. He continues, And his might and the wonders that he has done, he established a testimony in Jacob, he appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God. Psalm 78. What Christian parent doesn't want what is said here? What Christian parent doesn't want what is said here in Psalm 78? Well, does your marriage say that you do? Husband, dad, back to our first evaluative tool. Your task is to model what the objective gospel looks like. And it looks like blood, sweat, and tears. Is that what Junior is seeing? Is that what little Susie admires in you? A man who has given his life away to Jesus and his entire life says that he has. You live it, you talk it, you discuss it, and when you fail, they see and hear you confess it. Wife and mother, back to our first evaluative tool, your task is to model for the world what a personal response to the gospel looks like. You are to model what salvation does and it looks like submitting and respecting their father. They see you literally and figuratively put your hand in your husband's and say, lead me. But this isn't happening as much as, much as it should, is it not? Rob Rayburn, friend, Quoted in Susan Hunt's Heirs of the Covenant. The gospel will always fail to command attention and carry conviction when large numbers of those who grow up under its influence are observed abandoning it for the world. Inscribing the doctrine of covenant succession upon the heart of family and church must have a wonderfully solemnizing and galvanizing effect. It will set Christian parents seriously to work on the spiritual nurture of their children, equipping them and requiring them, requiring them to live the life of covenant faith and duty to win their God and Savior called them at the headwaters of life. And, ever conscious of the greater effect of parental example, they will forsake the easy way, shamelessly and joyfully to live a life of devotion and obedience which adorns and enables the faith in the eyes of their children. Two more sentences from him. This they will do who embrace the Bible's doctrine. Lest the Lord on the great day should say to them, and now he quotes from Ezekiel 16, you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and you sacrificed them to idols. Now Rayburn slipped a doctrinal phrase in there, covenant succession, probably new to most of you. But do you know it? Do you believe it? Do you act upon it? Our people here in this church should. The short of it being, do you take God at his word? That it was said, to, as, as it was said to the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, so it is said to you, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And oftentimes we stop there. But there's a comma there. You and your household Oh, you and your household? Disciple your children. Don't evangelize them. That would be fun to talk about to some of you. Disciple them. Don't evangelize them. What does that mean? What's he saying? Yes, of course, they must speak of their own faith, but by faith raise them knowing they will. And I'm talking about covenant theology here. It is why this church baptizes babies, as you see, Right over here. Like circumcision was in the Old Testament, baptism, we believe, is God's sign and seal upon the child that they belong to God. From there, dad and mom parent that child by faith. 
Not by doing this and that, believing that by doing this and doing that is going to produce a believing kid. No. But doing this and that, because that's what acting upon my faith does. Demonstrating I'm taking God at his word that he indeed is saving my sons and daughters. A godly marriage is a constant message to your children. You are telling them in countless ways, through countless means, what you desire most. And what is it? Godly offspring. You are telling them that every day through word and deed. And when your life and theirs is over, you plan on meeting them in heaven. So if I wait if tool number four of your parish, what is the spiritual aroma of your home? What are your kids smelling? Do you have a Bible-believing marriage, one that is compelling and attractive, one where mom and dad's relationship exemplifies the gospel? If you don't, then your parish is more like the liberal church that vacated God's word. Your children will likely run from the church to the world as soon as they are able. To close, too many Christian marriages are not founded upon the Bible. Rather, they are founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men and women. Do you have an orthodox marriage, one based upon the Bible, or do you have a liberal one, one more based upon the whims and emotions of sinful men and women? How is one to know? Envision your parish, excuse me, envision your marriage as a parish. Use the four evaluative tools. Do you remember them? Number one, husband, how well are you modeling the gospel? What saving looks like. Wives, how well are you modeling what the gospel does? What being saved looks like. Evaluative tool. Number two, husbands and wives, is your marriage breaking you? Are you being changed, transformed, sanctified, becoming more like Jesus? Number three, husbands and wives, have you built protective walls around your parish? Can you point to relationships, activities, passions of yours that have been renounced, postponed, lessened on account of your marriage? And number four, husbands and wives, what is the spiritual aroma of your marriage? What are your kids spiritually experiencing in your home? Do your children see your marriage exemplifying the gospel? Too many Christian marriages are not founded upon the Bible. Rather, they are founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men and women. Have a greater vision. Have a greater vision. Be a Bible-believing marriage, one that speaks truth to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you.